this week I still was on medical leave so I didn't have all my fancy books that I use to figure out what I'm going to preach and so I had to go on the internet and I found that you know there's a couple of different lectionaries they pretty well parallel themselves but this week there were two Hebrew scripture texts that were really kind of interesting. You heard one of them, the story of Joseph, and don't you wish you had his family, huh? You know, whenever you're like feeling really bad about the quirkiness of your own family, at least your brothers haven't sold you into slavery and tried to kill you, right? But it doesn't diminish the fact that sometimes families are challenging. The other one from the Hebrew scriptures is the story of Elijah. And interestingly enough, it all comes together with Jesus walking on the water and Peter, and I hope we can make the connections for you. Otherwise, I'm just kind of one of those lame brain people that hop all over the place. The story of Elijah was a prophet during the reign of King Ahab and Jezebel. And the prophets, Jezebel, was really into this um, idol worship of Baal. And Elijah was prompted by God to say, this is enough. It is time for Israel to be a godly, honoring nation. And so we're just going to have a competition between Baal and God. And, and it's a really great story about how one God was supposed to light the fire, the altar of the offering. And the Baal gods, well, they weren't successful. No, they're not even a spark. Okay? And then Elijah, he's like, well, let's really show who God is. And so they set this all up, and he digs a trench, and they drump it through with gallons and gallons and gallons of water so no fire should start, right? We're talking soaked wood. Nothing should start. And then there's this blaze of fire that burns up all the offering, the wood on the altar, and all the water that's consuming it. And so God, Elijah has shown that God is God. God is beat Baal. And you know what happens sometimes when you have like just lived out a really great victory? A really great accomplishment? Everything breaks loose. And Jezebel got really angry and said, he is dead within 24 hours. Elijah has a bounty on his head, and he is to be killed in 24 hours. And you know what has happened? He's just seen this magnificent, mighty movement of God, right? Doing the impossible. And what does Elijah do? He runs. The queen is going to kill me, and he runs. And as he gets to a place where he can't run anymore, he stops, and an angel meets him and fixes him some warm bread. It says, take a rest for your journey. And Elijah ends up in this cave, and he is like going, God, I worked really hard for you. I'm one of your best prophets. I stood up to all those people. Why are you letting me be killed? And he rages back on forth with God for a while. And then God says, well, why are you here? Come on out. Talk with me. And he says he's on the cliff of the cave. This huge mighty wind comes by. But he doesn't encounter God. This huge powerful storm comes by and he doesn't feel the presence of God. Fire comes by. All these major we call them theophany experiences for the seminarians. God movements, changing nature. And then there's quiet. Quiet. And he encounters God. And God speaks to him and says, go and do these things. And he has the strength within him, knowing that his, there's still a bounty on him, to step out and do his work. Com important things. I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where maybe, I hope, there's never been a bounty on your name, that nobody's been out to get you to do a contract upon your life. 
But there might be some time when you have felt really persecuted, that you stood up for the right thing. You spoke when no one else would speak. You did something really out there. And then all of a sudden, you're the bad actor. You're the bad guy. And while nobody's going to off you physically, they're going to probably try to hurt you in your career or diminish who you are. And you might not feel God's presence in that because it's a storm. It's a storm. But it's important to know that God met Elijah in the middle of the storm when he was feeling hopeless. And he nurtured him and he encouraged him, and God sent Elijah on to do more work. Then we have the story of Joseph. And yes, it is a dysfunctional family. We'll just say it. You know the, her, the, the, the coat about the sleeves that we also know of it as a coat of many colors. And the importance of this jacket was that it signified that when dad died, Joseph... Not the firstborn, not the secondborn, way down the list, born, was going to get the birthright. That everything dad had was going to go to this one, not the way it should have been, which was to Reuben. Oh, and by the way, Joseph was the one who had all those dreams about his brothers, you know, honoring him. Everybody knows little brothers are hard to have around sometimes. Maybe we've had those thoughts with younger siblings, but surely we, none of us sold them into slavery or tried to kill them. But here is Joseph. He has had all these dreams. He's had all these encounters with God. And he believes that God is going to do something mighty and great with him. And now he is in a pit. Betrayed by his brothers, totally betrayed by the people that he thought he could trust and love. And then he's hauled out of the pit, sent to some strange land that he doesn't know, maybe doesn't know the language, doesn't know the culture, no, doesn't know the customs, to be a slave. And we don't have in that text that God met him we don't have in that text that God said, oh, it's going to be okay, those dreams will come true. We don't have that in that text. But there was something that in that experience, Joseph went on and trusted. You see that as we go later on in the text, he is praying, he is connected to God, he is still worshiping, even though everything around him says, oh, that dream stuff... That fact that you're going to be somebody great? Well, <laughs> really? What were you drinking or thinking? And yet, God does something tremendous for the family and for Joseph in that. God empowered him to continue on, even though everything in the world showed it wouldn't happen right. The dreams would not come true. And then we have the story of Peter in the boat. We have them out in the middle of the lake. I'm not much of a salesperson. Sailing person, not a salesperson, sailing person. I have to tell you that this summer I was on a paddle boat with my children and I was highly nervous. I think we maybe got 500 feet from the shore. These guys were in a boat. It was not a calm, beautiful Sunday afternoon sailing. It was a night where you don't see. It's dark. The winds are whipping. The boat is rocking. And it's not looking good. And they see some figure over there. And they're like, it's a ghost. And they're scared. And then Peter looks and says, wait a minute. I think that's Jesus. And he's like walking through the storm. And Peter calls out and says, let me come to you. And he fixes his eyes on Jesus. 
and he gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water. Isn't that the same stuff that Elijah was doing? Amazing, mighty things. Fire coming down from heaven, consuming wood and, and water. And that was like with Joseph going to a strange land and becoming like the right hand of Pharaoh. He walked on water. Until he got distracted. Until he began to notice the circumstances around him, the wind, the waves, and then he went, oh, you can fill in the blank. And he began to sink. And he got scared. And he cried out, save me, Jesus. Some of us are starting school tomorrow or this week. Some of us are going to a new school we've never been at. It's going to be nervous. I don't know where my locker is. I don't know where my books are. It's going to be scary. Some of us are going into an important business meeting this week. It maybe shapes our careers, moves it forward. Or maybe it's political stuff that we don't even know how to navigate. Some of us have had our dreams totally crushed. Totally impossible for those things that we just knew were supposed to happen, to happen. No matter where we are today, there is truth in the fact that if we can fix our eyes on Jesus, if we can come into that place where we encounter God, we're going to find within our hearts, we're going to find within our souls a peace. Even though there is a storm raging all around us, even though there is chaos, even though there are things that would cause us to worry, we will still find that centered peace. And we find the strength to walk on. So my challenge for you this week is keep calm and walk on. Keep centered, keep focused, and step out. And then another step, and keep on. The great things that God has for you to be do have not been accomplished yet. Oh yes, God has used you mightily. God has used you mightily. But there's more. There's more. Focus your eyes. Step out. And walk. For the glory of God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, just help us find that quiet place in you where we know you and hear your voice and see your face. And give us the courage to step out and walk on. We pause before you and lift up our joys, our thanksgivings, and our prayer concerns.